So I'd like to turn the floor over to Sharon. I'm very excited to hear what you have to say today. So OSCM. Thank you. Is my microphone working? Yes, it is. I can hear myself. Um, uh, I want to thank, again, acknowledge the, uh, uh, the uh, Coast Salish territory that I'm standing on, and, and I'm so grateful to be able to come and talk to you. I am uh, very grateful to have been invited, and uh, when they asked me what I wanted to talk about, uh, it took me a long time to, to get back to them because of my schedule. But I said um, uh, equality, women's equality, indigenous women's equality. And, uh, but before I get into that, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. I'm uh, um, in La Ketmach from South Central British Columbia. My home is uh, uh, in Merritt, BC. I, have, um, I was born there. I was born in a little house by the river. And uh, my mom and my dad were born there as well. And my, my grandmother, uh, my grandmother and uh, her siblings from uh, my mom and my mom's family uh, back as far as we know. We've been born within a 20 kilometer radius of each other. Uh, and uh, my children have all been born there. And my grandchildren have all been born there. And I have two great grandsons. They're not uh, delivering babies in Merritt anymore. Haven't since 2000 when my last granddaughter was born in Merritt. And they, they have to go off to Kamloops or Kelowna. And my, my grandson's um, partner went to Kelowna for her oldest one. And the youngest one was, uh, was due uh, at the end of April uh, uh, two years ago. And he... Uh, I got, got the text in, at 6 o'clock in the morning, CJ and Kelly are heading for Kelowna, the baby's going to be born today, and I got a text about 20 minutes later, change of plans, Carson decided to be born in his home territory, so he went up to the hospital and got delivered in emergency up there. Uh, so, uh, so he knew where he belonged and he wasn't going to leave his territory too soon. Uh, but anyway, um, I've been working... Uh, doing activist work. I, I actually work to make a living being a, a, a college professor. And I also have um, several degrees in law and uh, practice law and do all sorts of interesting things. Uh, but I, I earn my living by teaching and I absolutely love it. But I do probably um, half or two thirds of my time doing the activist work. Uh, and I've been doing it, it for a very long, long time. I've been at it for at least 50 years. And so what, what do I want to tell you? Because you, know, you all saw that there, the um, inquiry on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls was, uh, was um, presented today. They talk about the discrimination and, and the things that come to uh, indigenous women just because they're indigenous women. I know that very early on, they keep saying when they are women go missing or and they eventually turned up murdered for the most part, the typical phrase is um, they lived an at-risk lifestyle. And that's the first thing that they say, okay, well, she lived an at-risk lifestyle. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, Francine, you were born into a, a at-risk lifestyle. So it, by virtue of being born indigenous and female, we are at risk. And I'm old enough to know that I had early training. If you ever see a white man, hide. And my, my, my mother and her generation were told the same thing. And for indigenous women, white men have been our nemesis and our danger uh, from the time that the first white man sat or, or set foot in, uh, in our country, which is now Canada. And not only is it because we're always at risk for being, uh, you know, 
abused, raped, murdered, and just left like a pile of garbage and walked away from. But we also have those white men that lead our government that made sure that the legislation uh, entrenched our place in society. It made sure from the t from uh, the very beginning up until 1951, all Indians were not persons. The actual, the definition of the in, in the Indian Act was anyone other than an Indian. And as the legislation progressed, because the comprehensive legislation really kicked in in 1951, there were uh, legislation before that that had the discrimination built into it. 1951 was where the legislation changed uh, sig significantly and um, as a matter of law, not policy, because before 1951 the policy was, and the way they enacted it was that if you were a woman, or the definition of Indian was an Indian man, his wife, and his children. So if you were not an Indian man, you had to attach yourself to one in order to be considered an Indian. You either had to be married to one or be, have one as a father. And if you didn't, your recognition as an Indian from the government was very precarious. But they did put legislation into place that solidified it that uh, as an Indian man, you could marry whoever you wanted, and your wife, if your wife was Chinese, she could be, she was considered an Indian. If your wife was white, she was considered an Indian. Recognized and came, all the rights that came with it. And if you were an Indian woman and you married someone who was not an Indian, even if he was an of Aboriginal ancestry, but didn't, wasn't recognized, they called them non-status Indians, you lost your status. And, um, and it's the war I talked a little bit about earlier this morning because if they could get rid of us, get us away from our support and away from our families and, um, and leave us out here in the world like we have all around here where there's no support and you fight to survive and you don't have the support, passing traditions and language on to the kids gets really, really hard. And of course, those Chinese wives and those white wives and whatever, they don't have the ability to pass on the culture and the language. And so it, it was a really insidious way of stripping the communities of that link that goes to the next generation. And, uh, and also, I, I don't have time to talk to you about the all sorts of way that it, it was implemented, but the legislation was very clear that yeah, you cannot, you could be an Indian all of your life and when you got, if you married somebody uh, who was not, that was it, you're not considered an Indian anymore, you've got to get off um, out of the housing, you've got to get away from your community and you could not exercise any rights. Because, you know, after long fought battles uh, into the 50s and 60s, Aboriginal right to hunt and fish and gather and that finally was recognized. Well, not fully, but it was recognized. And there are cases that, I, that I've um, looked at for s several purposes where um, a man went out hunting or went out fishing because we, we have uh, periods of the year where the fish are running, went out fishing and um, caught the fish and distributed it just like he did every other year. And uh, the fish warden came and took his fish, uh, took his equipment, that, the, and the equipment is long in making, you know, the nets and that, you, they're really, really hard and, hard and takes a long time to make. And told them that he had distributed fish to, uh, he'd given food fish to somebody who was not eligible for it. And there, therefore, they took all of his stuff, and then they uh, eventually ended up giving him a big fine. His, he didn't get his fish back, but he did get his net back. And uh, the person that he gave the fish to was his daughter. And his daughter had married a non-Indian. So she was no longer eligible. And so specifically focusing on those kinds of things. And of course, everybody, 
everybody said, yeah, that's fair. It's the law. The law says, if that's what the law says, uh, that, that's what happens, right? And everybody knows that the law is so powerful that you cannot choose not to follow it. And if you do, you should be punished. And um, lots of situations like that, but for, for us as Indigenous women, I, my husband was non-Indigenous. And, uh, and we had a lot of interesting consequences to that. Uh, and the government had a lot of interesting consequences to that as well. Because in 1985, April the 17th, 1985, Canada's uh, uh, constitution, uh, uh, the equality sections in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms kicked in. And so the government had been given three years to clean up all of the legislation, clean up their acts, so to speak, because they had legislation across the board, provincially, federally, that discriminated against women, mostly, but of um, minority groups, they call them, but that, you know, they're non-whites, basically. And, uh, and so they did. They had three years, and they cleaned it all up. And that's why we got the legislation in 1985 called uh, C-31. The government didn't relent and say, oh, my God, they're still discriminating against Indigenous women. We better change that legislation. They were forced to, and they were uh, April, May, June, uh, three months late, three months late in putting it into place. It was supposed to be April the 17th, and it wasn't until June the 26th. So, but they didn't do it because they thought it was a good idea. They do it, did it because they were forced to. And they did it badly. Because those of us who are, are, um, were given our status back in 19, uh, well, uh, supposedly in 1986, well, they didn't give us back what we lost. We, uh, my brother, who was wonderful and I love him dearly and is a great hunter, great fisherman, and he doesn't care about what these kinds of things. Well, um, he has way better status than I do. He could pass it on, his wife, both of his wives, he married out twice to white women, and both of his wives have better status than I do. And, uh, and so the legislation was pretty crappy. And so I applied for my status and status for my kids and, and they gave me status and wouldn't give my kids status. And so in July, 19, July 1989, I filed an appeal because they, they denied my children. I appealed back to them and they said no. And so then I could take it to the court. In July uh, um, 1989, I was, I filed appeal with the court. And from July 1989 to October 2006, it took us that long to get into court. And mainly because they knew, they knew what they did. They knew that they deliberately left a bunch of us out for whatever reason they, they, they couldn't justify. So, but they did delay tactic after delay tactic, crazy stuff. They'd go into the court just, and for those of you who know courts, um, there's a chamber's court. And so you make an application, you go in and you talk to the, whoever the judge happens to be that day. And if you give him a credible argument, he'll give you your, you know, grant your order. So they would go in and do that. And, you know, it's a new judge and, you know, and there was no evidence or nothing. You could argue against it, but... Uh, Crown is always honorable and they'll do what they're supposed to do. And so we got, um, we just couldn't get to court. We could not get, we could not even get to setting down a trial. We, we kept adjourning and adjourning and adjourning. And finally in, um, in uh, oh gosh, July of 2005, um, my, my good friend and lawyer at, that was representing me, uh, we engaged another lawyer from downtown Vancouver that uh, specialized in administrative law. And so he knew how to navigate the court, you know, if you couldn't do, get to court like we did. And he, he did an excellent job. And what he did was he made an application to get, to have a, a judge assigned to the case. And that meant that that judge then would take, 
you couldn't get you just didn't couldn't get a random judge again that would give you what you wanted and this one would be what they call seized of it and then um, it turned out to be a she and she then knew the history she could look at the files and that and so we got that in uh, in July of 2005, in January 2005, when we went back to court, they asked for another adjournment, but um, they had a good reason that time because we had changed uh, our, our um, style and, and a couple of things. And so the, the court gave, she said to them, her, Madam Justice Ross, she said to, to uh, the Canada, um, okay, I'll give you this because you can probably appeal it and get it, but we're going to go to court this year. We're going to have trial this year. That was in uh, in ja end of January 2006. And so all of a sudden, the man that was doing it uh, for since 1989 disappeared from the file. His only job was to keep us out of court. And then we got somebody else, uh, um, somebody else uh, assigned to it, and then away we went. And so we got to court, we did the trial in um, October, November of 2006. But we did have a couple of glitches along the way. They did uh, what they called an examination for discovery in uh, June, actually today, in 2006, June the 3rd is when we started it and they did it for four days and they cross-examined me for three days and my son for one day because my son and I are, are uh, the uh, plaintiffs. And um, it was an interesting uh, exercise because they tried to show that I wasn't attached to my people because a lot of people that have been displaced, they you know, they're living in the city because they have no choice and so they haven't had any um, good uh, connection. And so that was the first thing. They, they thought that because I've been hounding them forever, um, they wanted to show that I was just a, a troublemaker and I really didn't have an interest in my, in my community. And so they brought out a map and they put the map, big map of our territory. And they said, okay, um, Ms. McIver, can you tell us where your, where your territory is? Because this, it, it didn't give the whole province, but most of um, are in the central. And I, I said, uh, all of it. And he said, no, no, I want to know where your territory is. Our territory is unceded. We have never had a treaty, and it all belongs to us. Well, no, no, well, why? <laughs> And, and, and they said, well, no, no, well, what about your reserves? I just want you know the reserve land that had been set aside. I said, to point out where your reserve land lies. And I said, okay, okay, here. And, you know, they, they had uh, Shalouz and they had Zocht and the others. And I'm just looking at them and I said, hey, you've missed this one. I said, there's one up here just by, out, out of Kolshana. And... Uh, and I said, it's not even marked here. You don't have that on there. And I said, and you missed another one over here. And so they folded it up and put it away. Because what they were trying to do was to show that I had no connection to my land and I didn't know my territory. And they, they did several things very similar to that. The other thing is that I have, I've, been, I've done um, uh, master's work and doctoral work and have published in uh, journals and that. So. Everything that I'd written uh, since I did my post-secondary and everything that uh, was published anywhere that I had a hand in, they put it before me. Then they were trying to show that I was an, you know, an activist and not really a proper plaintiff. And so it was really interesting because they would put down my, one of my uh, uh, writings and they'd highlighted a bunch of stuff and it was kind of, you know, I, I have very definite ideas about rights and that. So is that yours? Read it out for the record. Yes. Did you write that? Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes. And, you know, after about 15 of this, I finally said, are you asking me if I agree with myself? And, and they said, well, yes. And uh, ironically, about three 
later, there was something, you know how sometimes you write and then you kind of change your mind? Well, I had changed my mind. That was a really early one, I changed my mind. But anyway, um, they did that and they just were trying to totally discredit me. And, and, um, and she asked me a question and I answered, I thought about it and I answered her and then she tried to challenge me on it. And I, and I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm, I'm trying to get clarification. I said, no, you're not. What you're trying to do is make me contradict myself and then, then it, you, you'll argue that I don't know what I'm talking about. And anyway, so we did have several exchanges that were interesting. And then, um, uh, so they did that for three days and my lawyer said <laughs> I was the best witness he'd ever, ever saw. <laughs> Uh, but the, uh, I was really worried because I have my oldest son was, uh, um, if you saw him, he's a huge hulk of a man. He's six foot four and he goes probably 250, 260. And, uh, and so I said, I'm really afraid. I'm afraid because the lawyer that was on the case and cross-examined me was a woman by the name of Sarah Pike. And I said, mm, my son might have a problem because he will not say no to a woman. <laughs> said he's been raised in very strong matriarchal family and he will, he will not contradict you. He, you know, he won't necessarily agree and he'll discuss it, but he won't contradict you and he won't say no. And so I'm really afraid that when she starts to cross-examine him, he's going to, you know, it's going to be hard for him to get get the things out because of how he's been trained. And so anyway, we had to cross that bridge. And so come in the next morning and, and Sarah looks at Jake and Sarah's probably uh, maybe five foot and tiny little woman. She looks up at my son and he's sat down and, and he's got a gruff voice and, and they swore him in and she looked at us. She looked at her colleague who was um, her um, male colleague and she says, Will you cross-examine him? Well, that worked out great for us. He had no problem telling that guy anything. <laughs> but, but what happened, this was, uh, this was June of 2006, and in July of 2006, we got a letter from the uh, department and said, oh, by the way, we've looked at your situation again, and uh, we think your son uh, has status. So... Um, We'll give him his status, uh, half status, by the way, and, and half status means that he can't pass it on to his children without, uh, uh, without the other person having status as well. Um, and they, okay, that's the end of the case now. We don't have to go to court on it. And uh, my son and I talked about it, well, maybe by uh, 30 seconds. And, my, and he said, uh-uh, because -uh, he... The case would only affect him if we let it go at that point because there was no decision. And so he said no. And that meant he could, didn't have status. He could have had status that day if he'd agreed. And he said, no, Mom, there's so many out there. And so we, we continued on and we went to, we, then they petitioned the court to throw our case out because what we were asking for was moot, right? And, uh, and so they went in front of Sarah, our, uh, Madam Justice Ross in September and um, applied to have the case thrown out. And uh, we, had, um, we argued against it. And uh, the other thing we asked is if, because they discovered this information, and it, it was bogus, but this information that gave my son status um, we asked, okay, well, but can you order him to have status? And um, they said, well, you know, you didn't apply, and we didn't. You didn't apply, and so if, um, if the uh, government says it's okay, it can be a consent order, and they said no. They wouldn't let him have status. They said, oh, we have to consult with our client. So anyway, uh, we ended up, and Owen, oh, Madam Justice Ross said, uh, okay, I'll take the application under advisement, but if I were you, Sarah Pike, uh, I'd get ready to go to trial. And so we, we did have trial in October and November. It was an interesting uh, few days for me because I was the primary witness and they didn't call my son. They didn't, uh, we decided not to call him because it, uh, 
you know, I could get it all out. And they decided not to call him, for which I was grateful. And uh, we waited there. Uh, BC Supreme Court usually will have a decision within three months. And uh, three months went, came and went, April, March, April, May, nothing. And so um, we didn't know what was going on. Hopefully she wasn't having too much difficulty. And, and um, I'm a grandmother. I'm, I'm a mother and a grandmother. I actually have a son uh, uh, that's uh, younger than three of my grandsons. And I have a, a grandson that's the same age as my son. So anyway, I'm down at the park on, uh, on, on a nice sunny Friday. You know, the park where they do the track meets. And there's a track meet going on, and I have the kids are all the, around the same age, and so you know, I'm sitting there like any good grandmother with my lawn chair right next to the track, watching what's going on. And and I'd gotten a um, a phone call from my lawyer Gwen uh, earlier on, and I said, oh, I, I don't want to deal with this, you know. It, as much as I'm making fun of it now, it's really stressful. And so I said, okay, now I'm going to enjoy my day. And so I was enjoying my day and. My, my uh, oldest grandson was going to run, uh, you know, the mile, it used to be the mile, you know, a thousand meters or whatever. Anyway, he's going to run that and, and so I'm there waiting and, and uh, they start. And of course, it takes a long time and, and my friend comes to me and she said, Gwen's been f phoning, you better call her. And I said, no, I'll do it when we're done here. I just don't want to deal with that stuff right now. She said, no, she said it was important. So um, she said, give me your phone. So I gave her my phone, and she dialed Gwen. And I, I said, hello. And she said, Sharon, we've won. And right at that moment, the kids were crossing the finish line, and everybody was yelling. And she said, what's going on? She said, Sharon, we've won. And everybody started, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we did win, uh, totally. Totally won that first, uh, uh, or the first decision, but the second decision they cut it back, and then when it went to be uh, put into place, like the they told the government they had to change the law because they discriminated against me and my son, um, and um, a lot, whole lot of others. We we estimated about 350,000 people would be affected, and then uh, um, they didn't give us the remedy that the court said they should give us. And uh, they, uh, we, they included my son and they included my grandchildren. And uh, the children and grandchildren, uh, but mostly grandchildren were affected. And so uh, about 45,000 grandchildren uh, were ineligible and obtained their status because of that, legis that legislative change. And uh, I'm always saying I've got 45,000 new grandchildren. <laughs> and, uh, and as over the years, because this was in 2000, by the time they, they changed a lot was 2011. And so over the years I've done these kind of talks a lot. And I don't know how many of uh, these kind of sessions, you know, in universities, all over the place, people will come up to me and say, I'm one of yours. I'm one of yours, usually in tears. Um, but what happened? What happened to that other 300,000? Well, they didn't, they, they didn't include them and they refused to include them. So we, uh, in 2010, sent a, sent a petition off to the United Nations Human Rights Committee telling the ask, under what they call uh, the Section 8 protocol, and it, it's a legally stuff, but basically Canada has, has committed under the protocol that the UN could hear a case and could order the, the Canadian government to comply if they have uh, contravened the, the convention. And so we, that's what we did. And, uh, and then there were a couple of other cases that came not as comprehensive of mine, but you know, they, little things like the Desjardins case is about cousins you've got. Because if you look down the line, the, the female line, um, their children, 
uh, and grandchildren don't go as far as the male line. And so if you, if you have cousins down the male line that has status and, and their full cousins from the female line doesn't, that's what the Desjardins case does. It says, okay, we'll give those kids status that are, that are down the female line or the cousins down the female line. And just really, really, really narrow. And so we lobbied really hard uh, with uh, a lot of allies. Uh, you know, I, I'm done a, done a minuscule piece of the work. I've got lots of allies that have done a lot of work. And I, I didn't acknowledge that um, before me were women that were dedicated, Mary Tuax, Early Jeanette Corbier Laval, Eva, Yvonne Bedard. Um, Sandra Lovelace. So, you know, this isn't a solo journey. Us women have not let this thing go. Um, and so, um, so what happened in uh, the, we call it Bill S3, which was the Desjardins decision, we lobbied the Senate heavily. And the Senate changed the legislation because they weren't going to take all the discrimination out. Changed the legislation and uh, put in what Madam Justice Ross had approved for us what we had drafted way back in 2006, and now we're in 2017. And they um, uh, put into place the legislation that would take the bulk of the discrimination out and um, said, send it back to the House of Commons. And the House of Commons uh, said, no, we don't like it, and they just changed it back to what it was. and so. Heading, and they're under a deadline. They've got a deadline because the court imposed a deadline. And so they went, they uh, were going to send it back to the Senate, and the Senate said, if you send it back to us, we're just going to change it again. And so they were at a deadlock. And so they didn't change it. Uh, and I just want to say that in uh, 2017, when they voted in the House of Commons, to approve that when prove it when they changed it back, uh, and it was almost unanimous in the House of Commons that they would change it back to put the discrimination back in. It was on June the 21st, uh, 2017, National Aboriginal Day, and uh, we do have a list of the the MPs that voted uh, with us, and there weren't very many of them. But anyway, uh, they decided not to bring it back and ask the court for a, a, an extension. And so they were given an extension into, uh, into early 2018. And so what happened then was uh, they sent it, we were waiting, you know, we're all there waiting because we knew that it had to go back to the Senate and we had the Senate on board. And what they did is they sent back to the Senate uh, Bill S3, and they put in two sections that took care of the bulk of the discrimination that we had been arguing uh, to get rid of, and uh, and they but they did they didn't allow them to be um, enacted at the same time as the rest of the bill. They've got uh, a, a caveat in it, and it's a, that's a legal word for something to an exception, right? So those two sections that will get the bulk of the discrimination out of the Indian Act um, are yet to be declared law. And the Senate said, okay, yeah, we're under a deadline. It looks like you've got, you know, you're uh, sincere about this. So okay, we'll, um, we'll pass it. And so it did uh, pass into law in December of 2017. With those two sections there ready, but not, uh, not enacted yet. And so uh, since then, we've been lobbying and doing everything in our power to, to, to uh, what, they, or what I didn't say is that um, it says that it, can, it doesn't have to go through the process again. All it has to do is, is it can be enacted with uh, an order in council. And that's basically the prime minister and his cabinet just saying, okay, this will become effective on this day. And if, and if it does, that means that the bulk of the discrimination that's been in the Indian Act for over 143 years will mostly be gone. There's a couple of little things that around some sections that, but this will take care of, they, they estimate now about 285,000. So we're looking at probably the 35,000 that, that didn't 
get status in uh, 2011 have probably died. That's why that it's, it's quite a bit less. And so when uh, we're looking at the, this legislation, it's sitting there. The, in the meantime, my, my petition to the United Nations that we, we put in in November 2010, uh, we got a decision on, in January, on January the 11th, 2019, this January, and the uh, United Nations told Canada uh, that they were in violation of the convention and, uh, you know, all of the things we talked about today, the root cause of the, the discrimination against women and all of that, and they ordered Canada to enact those two sec sections because they've even admitted they knew because they have two sections sitting there that will fix it. And they told them to enact those sections, but they're still not doing that. So, anyway, we're, we're still moving on it and... Uh, uh, it would be, wouldn't it be so nice if they would tomorrow, because the, uh, the, um, the uh, cabinet meets every Tuesday, and in beginning of March, we started a campaign ca called uh, Any Given Tuesday. They can give, um, the uh, law can give equality to Aboriginal women. And uh, so they could do it tomorrow, but it would be really cool if they did it and enacted it on the 21st of June, 2019. Uh, but you know what? I don't trust those guys. <laughs> no, I don't trust those guys. And they're, uh, um, they are nemesis. They have been and they continue to be. You know, uh, the bulk of the, the serial killers are white, uh, white men. Some of our indigenous women uh, as uh, uh, Bernard Valcour was saying, oh, they're killed by indigenous men, they're not. It's the white men that are going out there and, and getting them and killing them. And, you know, uh, I think, uh, I'm, I keep looking at Francine. Francine and I are, are from the same nation. And uh, we have a young girl from my community, my reserve, our community, but my reserve, that, I, um, was uh, picnic ground outhouses, and it just indicates how people think about who we are. If they can, you know, do all of that, and then that last thing, they had to bring her body up out of a, an outhouse. And so when, when we're looking at the discrimination, I didn't talk about any of the other stuff that we've, uh, that we encounter them, you know, we, uh, walk into a, uh, even now actually, <laughs> walk into a, a store and they follow me around. Uh, I, w I was in a store in, in another city in the United States and it was, hot, it was uh, Aboriginal uh, stuff. And in the bottom floor was all the stuff made in China and that, and I wasn't interested in that. But on the upper floor they had the really good stuff. They had um, a whole... I'd never buy it, but it was beautiful. A whole, um, a horse, uh, you know, with all of the, uh, the bridle and the thing that go over the back and the saddle, all beaded, worth about $55,000. But all sorts of stuff like that. And so I went up to, to uh, look at it, um, not dressed much differently than I am. And uh, the, the clerk followed me around. And so I had a con started having conversation with her. Uh, and real, I was really nice. I'm mo nice most of the time. Uh, but I said something like, "Yeah, I know it's really difficult, and you know, in the retail business where um, you, your profits are cut down by you know the losses through shoplifting and that. I understand that." And then she started getting embarrassed. And then, oh no no no! I said, "No no, it's okay. You know, I, I understand." And that before I knew it, she was showing me their really good stuff. But, but the idea was, though, that she took one look at me and thought that somehow I was a danger to, to her merchandise. And, uh, and so, and, and it starts, it starts really early. You know, when the boys are about five, when they stop being cute kids and they start being suspected of being criminals. And um, my granddaughter, uh, is uh, she's 18 now, but when she was 
five going on six, we were at a place, we were on vacation, and she's, she's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, not, uh, uh, I, ca I told her that, you know, honey, her name is Inkika Honey, and uh, she was all dressed up for her prom, and she, she's gorgeous. And I said, you know, baby, you're absolutely gorgeous. And it's not that dress, it's genetics, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we were there, and um, she had a little sundress on, and she's got you know, long brown hair with a beautiful, you know, French braid in it. And genetically, actually, she ended up with blue eyes. I think it was her grandfather that did that. But anyway, and she's just standing there looking around, and she's tanned because we'd been, we'd been um, in the sun for a while. And these, there was these two guys looking at her, and it wasn't, it was... It was awful. They were just looking at her in a very sexualized way, and, and my son-in-law got really upset. But that's what happens. You see, she's not a cute little girl at five and six. She's a sexual object and at five and six. And that's what our girls do uh, are subjected to, and some a lot younger. And so when we're looking at how do we fix this? Well, as I was saying, First and foremost, you as a country cannot fix it until you fix yourself. And the first thing you have to do is change the doggone legislation that at least at law, the country recognizes, A, that we're equal and that we have rights. We are rights holders. And you don't, you don't get to hold those back because what they've told us, well, we've got to consult. We don't know if, uh, if everybody is going to agree that you guys can have equality. And they, they know. You can't tell me I can't have equality. But you know what? I can't tell me either. That's how it works. I can't say, OK, well, no, I won't have equality. It's OK. Uh, because the law says that you have, you know, you have your rights and you cannot give them up. You can't do it in a collective agreement, for instance. You can't give up the basic rights there. And that's how the law is. But for us, it's not that simple. For us, it's OK to continue to discriminate against us. And it's OK. I've had a personal conversation with the last 16, that's one six, ministers of Indian Affairs. <laughs> that's how long I've been at it. And talk to them about this issue. And they just say, no, 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 uh, you know, we've got to talk to the, you know, you've got to, they, basically what they say, I don't think your communities want you back, and it's our job to make sure that you don't get back there. That's what they've told us, actually. That's what Martin Rayer, who is the, oh, somebody, something, something assistant to uh, Carolyn Bennett, that's what he told me when we had a conversation with him, there's three of us that had a conversation. And he said, no, he said, you guys, are gonna, you guys are going to cause havoc and ruin the communities and it's our job to protect the communities from you. So, but anyway, I, I think I'm almost run out of time. Who's my timekeeper? Hey, I don't have a timekeeper. <laughs> I could have some fun now. <laughs> but anyway, I think I had, yeah, I'm just about there. That's, that's really good. I, I do a lot of lecturing, and I have a lot of young students, and, and so at one point I will, and I'm a really good storyteller, and, and so I'll start, and it's, oh, 11.45, and usually I let them out about, you know, 10 to 12. So, oh, feeling, uh, feeling, uh, um, well, and I say, and I start telling a story, and so they're sitting there, and it's 12 o'clock, and I'm still telling the story. And, and then now it's 12.15, and I'm still telling the story. And I'm just waiting for somebody to pick up their bag and, you know, start filling it or start shuffling in their seat. And so finally at 12.35, I say, well, don't you guys want to go? And they said, oh, yeah, when you're finished, we'll go. And, and one other thing that I can tell now, because it's years and years and years, when I, I defended my, uh, my uh, master's thesis, I, I had a supervisor, didn't have a clue. I was the expert, but I needed a supervisor. And so we, I had a panel, we all had a panel, and uh, my, my friend and I had the same panel because we're writing on uh, indigenous issues. Mine was about uh, uh, indigenous women's right to self-government. 
And uh, she uh, did another one. And so she went in and they raked her over the coals. She came out and she had to do a rewrite of certain things and all of that. And so she gave me the lowdown. So I went in and there were seven of them and uh, each one had a question or two in a period of time. And so she asked me the question, then I didn't answer a question, I just started to tell her how I got the idea for the thesis. And I, like the students, I just talked until they told me to stop. And I just telling them the story and I, you know, what happened and I, you know, I was in my fasting lodge when I, when I got the idea. And it all came to me in my fasting lodge. I didn't have to do any research. I had to go find research that supported what I said. Uh, and hardly anybody else. So when we did, I guess I can tell you this too. So when we couldn't find it, uh, I was with the Native Women's Association of Canada. So we wrote speeches for the president. And we got, had her to go out and give speeches. And then we would uh, uh, quote the speech as a, a source. <laughs> you can manufacture your own sources. But anyway, it's too late. They can't do anything about it. But anyway, at the end of the day, they did not stop me. And finally, when I was at the end of my time, I said, time's up. Um, do you want me to continue? And, and they said, well, if you're fit, not finished. <laughs> and I, uh, I did not, they took my thesis. I did not have to do a rewrite or anything of it. Anyway, I'm going to stop now. And, and thank you so much. You're a great audience. We got a little, we're getting a little tight on time here. I'm sure that's shocking to you. <laughs> uh, just really thank you for coming and sharing your wisdom with all of us. And I, I really like the creed in your own source. I'm going to start quoting Cecilia in more of my things that I do. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's... An, that's an empowering thing for us to do, is that we should all be quoting each other and we should all be amplifying our voices. So let's make sure that we're getting out there and we're doing that. Uh, some modern ways to do that, get those retweets going. Uh, get that Twitter, Twitter lighting up with our feminist delivers. So make sure you take some time to do that. Any given Tuesday. So um, I'll, I'll maybe take one question two questions hi I'm one of the people that um, got my status back through bill c31 because my parents left the reserve and disenfranchised and order to um, survive so uh, but I've got the kind where and I can't pass it on to my kids and um, even if I marry another um, status native person of Canada. So um, from what I got from what you were saying is that the law hasn't really changed um, until they amend it, even though the United Nations had said that they're contravening the, uh, you know, the Convention on Indigenous Rights, um, UNDRIP. So um, is there any hope for people like me that might get our status? Um, thanks. Uh, if they change the legislation, um, yes. If, if they enact those two sections, the answer is yes. Okay? So that was easy. <laughs> one, more, one more real quick question because we're, keep, we're between everybody and the amatos. Um, hi, I just want to say thank you for all your work. Um, I, I'm also like a Bill C-31, and I'm from the Treaty 10 territory in Manitoba. Um, I was reinstated in 1986, and I was able to get status for my oldest son. But what I noticed is, at the time when I applied, um, I was able to, I was accepted into my mother's band. Um, Northland's band, but I couldn't get my son accepted into the band. And as it is, um, because we were split in communities, I grew up non-status in another community where 
you know, the people that are now part of the North Ends Band moved. They were part of our same community. Um, they, they don't recognize me, uh, even though I'm a band member. And so I still have, you know, issues and difficulties with that. And I sometimes don't know where to go, like, you know, to get some answers. You know, there are things that are happening in my community, like land claims and settlements and stuff. Money, I know that's, you know, um, there for, for me, but I never see it. Do you have any suggestions on how I can, you know, maybe obtain this information and where to go for it? When I talked about uh, some issues still there that have to be dealt with, one of the big issues is that um, if you were uh, status and you married a man who was status, you automatically got transferred to his band. And when they, reinst when they did the, uh, the changes in uh, 1985, they didn't correct that. So every woman who was automatically, without her consent, transferred to another band, had to stay there. And what they said, well, your home band, your birth band, well, you can apply to get back, and if they take you, fine, and if they don't take you, fine. And so those are the kinds of things that I, when I said there are still things in there that go to the heart of what I'm talking about. Why couldn't they have decided that he could transfer to her band? Because for the women, a lot of times, they were the core of the family, and they still are. But they didn't, but it's all part and parcel of the same thing we're talking about, the genocidal thing. And so, yeah, there are issues that still have to be addressed. That's one. We have a bunch in our community, and our community's been, our, our band has been really, really reluctant to take uh, any of their women back. And especially if they take their women back, sometimes they won't take their women's children, or their, the women's children back. And so that's all, you know, it's all part of the, the big scheme. When they did the, um, when they did the colonization, and, and the British and, and, you know, the Europeans were really good at it. They knew exactly what they had to do. Okay, I need your kids. You're not, you know, uh, what did uh, Stalin say? Give me your kids from the time they're 5 to 16 in their mind forever, or 6 to 16 in their mind forever. So that was, it's all been a very planned out uh, process in absolutely every country they've colonized. So you've got to get rid of us. You've got to get rid of the indigenous women if we're going to oppress everybody and make sure that we get access to the land and resources, and we're really, really out of time. <laughs> oh, Sam. So for some light reading in your spare time, go and take a look at the Indian Act. <laughs> um, those of you who it doesn't apply to, the rest of us, we live it, we don't need to look at it. <laughs> Um, so we, we have a short break, uh, five minutes, try and keep, we've got another um, speaker coming up, so please give your body a stretch, honor, whatever wellness break you need to have, and back in your seats in five.